Okay, so we talked about um, this equation, which was basically the respiratory equivalent of F equals delta P over R. And we talked about the fact that the real difference in getting airflow is the difference between the pressure, atmospheric pressure, and alveolar pressure. Good? Okay. And um, that pressure difference is created by the contraction and relaxation of the respiratory muscles. And then um, we kind of basically said that if we set zero as atmospheric pressure, which is really 760 millimeters of mercury, if alveolar pressure drops below that, then air will move in. In between breaths, where, there, where it's equal to atmospheric pressure, pressure, air doesn't move anywhere. And if the pressure pops above 760, then air will move out. So all you're really doing is changing the pressure above and below atmospheric pressure via muscle contraction and relaxation. So the next topic to talk about is the R in that equation, F equals delta P over R. Um, remember when we talked about resistance with reference to the cardiovascular system, it was kind of like what's going on with the tubes, which added to friction and resistance. And here um, it's got a lot of similarity to that. So resistance in the respiratory system will primarily occur in the lungs if they're not stretchy enough. If they don't stretch when you pull on them and go with a thoracic cavity and then snap back because of elasticity, that will add to the resistance and then decrease the flow. So it can happen in the lungs, but it can also happen in the tubes. Um, the trachea, theoretically, the bronchi and the bronchioles, definitely. If anything narrows the tubes or gunks up the tubes, it's going to add to resistance and therefore decrease flow. Okay, so let's look at a little bit about th at that. So resistance is primarily impacted by the diameter of the ventilation passageways of the tubes. Um, and that is regulated by the nervous system. Specifically, the autonomic nervous system can cause bronchial constriction and bronchial dilation. Um, and then some hormones, epi especially, epinephrine, will actually cause bronchial dilation, which is part of another reason that if someone is having um, anaphylactic shock with also trouble breathing, like wheezing, epi will take care of their blood pressure by the mechanisms we've discussed over and over, which is heart rate, stroke volume, and systemic vasoconstriction. That's blood. But what it will also do is cause bronchial dilation so you can get more air in and out. Okay, so then there are some disorders, of course, that can impact this. Anything that causes mucus accumulation will gunk up the tube and increase resistance and therefore decrease flow. And you've all had that respiratory irritations, respiratory infections. Um, they can all add to resistance. Um, allergic responses that cause histamine release. Histamine will cause bronchial constriction under certain circumstances. And of course that increases resistance and decreases flow. And then um, if this goes on for a long time, regardless of what the reason, if you start get, getting scarring or fibrosis or thickening of the tissue in the tubes, that will increase resistance sort of more long-term. Um, and that happens for instance in tuberculosis. Okay. so. Resistance impacted by what is happening in the tubes, okay, bigger tubes, less resistance. Um, and then also um, by what is happening in the lungs, because the lungs should, um, because of this whole idea of the negative pressure that keeps the wall of the lungs stuck to the chest wall, this concept of intrapleural pressure, what should happen in a healthy lung is when the thoracic cavity in uh, expands upon inspiration, um, the lungs should pull with it really, really easily. They should stay nice and stuck to the wall and they should expand really easily. And then when you relax the muscle, the elasticity in the wall of the lungs should snap back and then they should help sort of snap the air out. So lung compliance is the concept of how stretchy and responsive the lungs are. So if you have really good lung compliance with healthy lungs, then a relatively small contraction easily causes lots of air moved in and then a good elastic snapback, healthy lungs. 
poor lung compliance, more muscular contraction is required to move air because there's more resistance and you get a much poorer elastic snapback. Okay, so those are sort of the two extremes. So let's talk about what impacts um, lung compliance. Well, one of them is just is the elastic tissue in the walls of your lungs in good shape. Um, if it is, then your lungs haven't been damaged a lot. There are some things that can, of course, damage them, like cystic fibrosis, like chronic lung problems. Um, so healthy lungs have lots of elastic snapback, okay, which helps to push air out. Sort of, um, and then um, the other thing is how low is this pressure in here compared to alveolar pressure? There needs to be a good dis difference between the two. So if alveolar pressure is zero between breaths, then intrapleural pressure, if it's negative one, it doesn't stay stuck as well. It's not as good as of a vacuum. So that concept is really just the dis difference between these two, the difference between um, the um, alveolar pressure in here which again is zero in between breaths and the pressure in here. That concept is called transpulmonary pressure. If it's nice and vacuumed in there and there's a good difference between them, then basically the um, they will stay stuck to the wall really well and they will move when you want them to. So basically with the transpulmonary pressure, you want the intrapleural pressure in here to be well below alveolar pressure, generally four below alveolar pressure on a good day. Um, the larger pressure difference between them creates um, like motivation for the alveoli to stay stuck and move with the thorax. So if that um, drops really dramatically, um, you know, you could get the extreme, which is a pneumothorax, but also it just wouldn't stay stuck as well. And then there's one more thing, and this one is um, not the, the fluid out here that we're talking about. It's the fluid inside the alveolus. So let's look at an alveolus more closely. So here at the end of your terminal bronchioles and respiratory bronchioles are this little grape crust cluster, um, individually called an alveolus, collectively called alveoli. And if you look at the inside of each one of them, it's made of simple squamous epithelium mostly, plus a couple of other different kinds of cells. One thing I haven't told you before is that the inside of the alveolus is moist, and the moisture is good. It helps with gas exchange, but it's also bad because it actually adds a little surface tension on the inside of the alveolus that opposes pulling on them, like water, hydrogen bonding of the water molecules in there, great for gas exchange creates a problem when you're actually trying to stretch them upon inspiration. So the surface tension inside the moist alveoli due to the hydrogen bonding actually adds to resistance, but it's okay in most people because when you stretch these guys, the cells on the side um, called type two cells, there's not a ton of them, but there's enough. When you stretch them, they actually secrete a like detergent that temporarily breaks up hydrogen bonding. It's called surfactant. So when you stretch them, they will actually secrete surfactant and then you'll be able to stretch them. So that's how it works in a healthy like post infant. But of course, in infants, um, your respiratory system is one of the last things to really complete development. So if you have a preterm infant like my son was, or sometimes even with full-term infants, what can happen is um, this surface tension on the inside of the alveoli exists because the membranes are moist, yes, but the type two cells haven't um, finished their development yet. So when you stretch them, the type two cells do not secrete surfactant and temporarily break up the hydrogen bonding. And so it causes real, real strain and so much resistance to pulling the lungs out. Um, and then um, <clears throat> the deep breathing should cause that to occur, but in infants, it's not. So this really affects premature baby, all can, also can affect full-term babies. And so you'll try really, really hard to pull on the alveoli and you're really, really um, resisting because of the hydrogen bonding. And then the snap back from the walls will sort of make the chest kind of collapse a little bit. Really strenuous effort to inspire, but expiration will occur pretty violently. So I'll show you a little video of respiratory distress syndrome of the newborn. This baby was eventually fine, as was my son, because I'll teach you, I'll tell you what they do about this in just a second.
his little chest is just straining and straining and straining. Um, so they figured out how to make surfactant in the lab. Um, so you can, at the same time you're giving the baby oxygen, you can also give them surfactant. Um, and then if things are otherwise okay, generally speaking, those type two cells will develop relatively quickly and the baby will be okay. Um, so um, that's respiratory distress syndrome of the newborn. Okay, last little tidbit is just a few more things about clinical connections related to resistance mostly. Um, so what kinds of things can add to resistance? Well, asthma, go back here, um, asthma is something, um, sometimes an allergy, sometimes something else, causing um, smooth muscle in the bronchioles to constrict. And so of course that increases resistance and decreases flow. And that's why there's wheezing and gasping for air because your resistance went up and your flow went down. Now, asthma can be an acute problem, but of course it can also be a chronic problem, um, sometimes associated with really chronic asthma, and asthma can be life-threatening, um, is uh, it can lead to chronic inflammation, inflammatory damage, and mucus accumulation in the respiratory tract. And it can also lead ultimately, not always, but to COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. So what do they do for asthma? Um, a combination of bronchodilators, yeah? and then maybe anti-inflammatory, sometimes steroids, of course, if the inflammation gets really severe. Now, emphysema, emphysema affects both resistance and gas exchange. So let me introduce you to emphysema. Emphysema is, um, uh, again, um, sometimes associated with chronic respiratory irritation. Really good way to get emphysema is to, by smoking, but that's certainly not the only way. So your alveoli um, should have lots and lots of surface area. I don't know if you can see this super well, but it's lots of little bitty, 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 tiny bubbles so that you've got tons and tons of surface area. Little bitty bubbles, all microscopic, like 750 square feet of it. With alveoli, a couple of different things happen. First off, um, your little bitty um, grape clusters, all the internal walls break down and they become more the size of a single kiwi. So you lose lots of surface area for gas exchange and that's a problem. But in addition, um, you also lose your snap back. They also lose the elasticity in the wall and that affects resistance. So it kind of hits you two different ways. What is pneumonia? Pneumonia is when some other irritation, it's not generally pneumonia by itself, unless of course you got air in there or fluid in there some other way. An inflammatory condition that may have started out with the flu, it may have started out with COVID, it may have started out with any number of things, results in fluid in the airways. And just because there's fluid in there, it actually increases resistance and decreases flow. It can make you feel like you're drowning. And then COPD is this big umbrella term, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder. The obstructive part is telling you that it's a resistance issue. Um, so what can cause this? Well, asthma, emphysema, uh, bronchitis, any of those things that are consistently increasing resistance, um, cigarettes, air pollution, plus uh, individual susceptibility, chronic bronchitis, um, all of these are really dramatically increasing air, airway resistance and therefore decreasing flow. The initial trigger could have been any number of things. Okay, that's resistance. We'll stop there and then I'll start on respiration on the next one.